Well, Happy New Year. It is so good to see you. I hope you all had a blessed Christmas. I hope you all had a blessed New Year celebration. And we are going to start off this brand new year with a new series because it is January 1st. It's the first day of the year. There's a lot of firsts in there, right? And so I thought, you know what? We should just start off on the right foot. So we're going to look at first things first. And uh, we're going to cover subjects like worship and marriage and friendship. And so right here on the beautiful New Year's Day, this brand new morning in 2023, I just want to tell you that God wants you to be really, really rich forever. (laughs) Okay, I have your attention. (laughs) Genesis 14. Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was priest of God Most High, and he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram by God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be God Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And Abram gave him a tenth of everything. So here we have Abram. He's returning from battle after Sodom and Gomorrah, three other cities, four kings had taken them over. And of course, this was of interest to Abram because of Lot, his nephew. So Abram armed his servants. He goes off to war and Abram got victory over these four kings. God gave him victory. And so Abram brings back all the treasures of Sodom and Gomorrah. He brings back all the spoils of war and he gives them to Melchizedek, who is the high priest. And the Bible says that Melchizedek gave him a tenth of everything, or he gave him the tithe. Now, when we use the word tithe in church, that's what we mean. We mean 10. And we see it for the very first time mentioned right here in the Old Testament. Now, a lot of people will say that uh, the tithe is a form of legalism that comes from the Old Testament. But we have to note that this is the first time we see it in the Bible, and it is now 430 years before the law is ever given. And I know some people, when they hear the word tithe or tenth, and they know, oh no, the pastor is gonna talk about money today. (laughs) They start to grumble, and they say, well, this is, the, this is just the pastor begging for money. Uh, that's, all, that's all he talks about. He always just talks about money. Well, the truth is, I usually only preach about money once or twice in a year. And you could say, well, maybe it's because, you know, the church had thousands of dollars of water damage this last Christmas Eve, and our new choir organ was destroyed. No, that's not why, because we should have insurance for that. Or maybe it's because we want to hire a new children's director this year. We want to add a new person to our staff. Or it's because of inflation. But in truth, we're talking about tithing today because of how I started this talk. God wants you to be really, really rich forever. Paul says in 1 Timothy, they are to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share thus storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the future, so that they may take hold of that which is truly life. It clearly says that you will store up treasure for yourself, doesn't it? You will store up treasure for yourself. But what about Jesus? Doesn't Jesus say something about storing up treasure? Yes, he does in Matthew 6. He says, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. Have you ever noticed that? Treasures in heaven, treasures in heaven. What does that mean? And do we want that? Do we want treasures in heaven? Because we probably don't, right? We don't want treasures in heaven, right? I want my treasures now. I want treasures on earth. Preferably, I would like like it in cash. (laughs) But wait, how how do you do that anyway? How do you store up treasure in heaven? How do you send your treasure up on ahead of you? Jesus and Paul both say that you can do this. Frederick Marriott, in his book, Masterman Ready, that he wrote in 1841, he gave us the popular quote, you can't take it with you. 
But according to Jesus and according to Paul, you can. You see, I think we try to store up treasures on earth because we think that the earth is our home. We try to make our home comfortable. But the Bible says our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Hebrews 13 says, For here we have no lasting city, but we seek the city that is to come. The Bible says that you are actually from a foreign city called heaven. You're only visiting here. The world is not your permanent residence. If you were, let's say you were visiting France, okay? You're visiting France and you're gonna stay for a month or so on business. Would you be worried about buying a house in France and then filling it with all kinds of expensive furniture? Of course not. That wouldn't be a wise investment, especially if you knew, I'm never gonna be back, right? But what if, while you were in France, you're there on business, that you actually made some money, right? You made some money, but, you know, it's all in euros. In a month, you're gonna be coming back to the States. So what do you do with all of that foreign currency? Just blow it in Europe because you can't take it with you? No, that's not wise either. The smart thing is to convert it to US currency, exchange it. You're gonna send your money on ahead of you. This is what Paul and Jesus are both saying. The earth is a short-lived place. Compared to the thousands and millions of years, you will be in heaven. The hundred years you spend here on earth will be a speck. It'll be a shadow. It'll be a glimpse. It'll be a blip. So Paul and Jesus argue, rather than invest in the temporary, invest in your future. Invest in your heavenly retirement. Store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. So how do you do that? Well, first let me say that we are not talking about salvation today. We are not talking about getting into heaven, okay? Your salvation is a gift. And that's what we spent Christmas Eve talking about. But the Bible still talks about the work that is done on earth. Not the work that gets us in the door, okay? But rather the work that earns heavenly treasure. Revelation 22 says, Behold, I am coming soon, bringing my recompense with me to repay each one for what he has done. Matthew 16, For the Son of Man is going to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will repay each person according to what he has done. Romans 2, he will render to each one according to his works. 1 Corinthians 3, he who plants and he who waters are one, and each will receive his wages according to his labor. 2 Corinthians 5, 10, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. These verses, okay, sometimes get confused with earning grace, but that's not what they are about. In fact, these words are more about judgment, appearing before God and then being rewarded for the work that was done. This is why I said at the very beginning that God wants you to be really, really rich forever, but to send that treasure up on ahead of you. That means you invest now in order to have a retirement fund in the future. <laughs> It means doing without some of that money today. So let's talk about your internal investment. I wanna be your financial advisor for eternity, okay? So you need to plan. You need to map it all out. And since the number seven is considered to be the perfect number, it is the number of holiness, perfection in the Bible, we'll make our time together the seven secrets of heavenly wealth. Secret number one, you must experience the cost of your own purchase. You must experience the cost of your own purchase. 1 Corinthians 6 says, for you were bought with a price, so glorify God in your body. Before you embark on a journey, before you put one foot on the path, a good rule is to carefully look around yourself and examine where you begin from, where are you starting from. If you're gonna to begin to invest in heaven, you must first examine the investment that God made in you. 
Corinthians says you were bought with a price. What price was that? The cross. The cross was costly. A life for a life. That's why we celebrated communion today. It is a reminder of what was given at our expense. And so before we talk about you investing in God's kingdom, we first need to recognize the investment that God made for you. Listen, you will only invest in God's heavenly eternity in the same extent that you've experienced God's heavenly investment in you. Jesus said it way better than me. He said, but he who is forgiven little loves little. In other words, if you see God's investment in you as something small, then you will only invest small yourself. But if you can experience the height and width and depth of God's investment in you as being a fortune, then likewise, you will return that investment. You will return that fortune. The next two of the seven secrets of heavenly wealth are a few things we need to believe. Secret number two is, it's all his anyway, right? It's all his. If I gave you a hundred bucks and then I said, all right, now give it back. That wouldn't be hard for you at all. You'd just give it right back. Because in your head, you'd be thinking, well, it was never really mine to begin with. To make it easier, if I handed you the money and I said, as I handed it to you, I'm gonna ask for this back. That'd be even easier. Because I gave it to you with the knowledge that you'd give it back. So you had no attachment to it. But what if I gave it to you, you put it in your wallet, and then a week later, I asked for it back? That'd be a little harder, wouldn't it? The money was never more yours or less yours, but it felt like it was yours because it was in your possession. In the Bible, God tells us it's all his. Psalm 50 says, for every beast of the forest is mine, the cattle on a thousand hills. I know all the birds of the hills and all that moves in the field is mine. And if I were hungry, I would not tell you, for the world and its fullness are mine. God says, you know that bowl that you sacrificed to me? It was already mine to begin with. It was already mine. You and I, we are God's money managers. We are his stewards and we are caretakers. And God allows us to have money. He allows us to have possessions. And he does so all the while handing it to us saying, I am letting you hold it, but it is mine. First Chronicles, King David says, but who am I and what is my people that we should be able thus to offer willingly? For all things come from you and of your own have we given you. We have all been given his resources. And the good news is God doesn't ask for all of it back. Abraham comes back from battle and he shows his thanks for victory by giving the high priest only one-tenth of his plunder, right? So secret number three is money, when given, turns into eternal reward. Money, when given, turns into eternal reward. The Bible says that God rewards those who are faithful. Hebrews 11, without faith, it is impossible to please him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. Second Corinthians says the point is this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly and whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Notice that in those two passages, there is something there. It is a, there is a promise there, right? Both of those are promises. Those are guarantees. The Bible does not say might. The, God, the Bible doesn't say possibly, maybe one day, right? It says he rewards. It says whoever sows will reap. Look at verse 10. He who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. He said he's going to increase your seed. What is the seed? It's your resources, right? It's your wealth. It's your treasures. It's your money. God will supply or increase your storehouse. Not to be confused with God making you rich, okay? It simply says, if you invest in God's kingdom, he will make sure that you continually have funds to invest. 
How do you do that? Look at the next verse, verse 11. You will be enriched in every way to be generous in every way, which through us will produce thanksgiving to God. The Bible says you will be blessed in every way. Your generosity is rewarded in God's generosity. Okay, but are there any here and now rewards? Absolutely. Romans 14 says, For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. What are eating and drinking? Eating and drinking is how we spend our money on earth. But the Bible says that when we invest in God's kingdom, we get two things. We get joy, right? We get joy. We just spent Christmas and all of winter talking about joy. And I said, isn't that something that you want more of? I want more joy in my life. And during Christmas, we said that there is a joy that comes from giving a gift, isn't there? Well, it's the same joy we feel when we give to God. Personally, I think the tithe feels like obligation. When we tithe, that's my obligation. That's what God asks of me. But whenever I can go above and beyond the tithe, there is a beautiful joy that comes from giving to God. And that generosity brings joy and, the Bible says, peace. Peace is another heavenly benefit you get on earth right now. And here's the ironic thing. Most of us don't have peace with money. Most of us feel like we never have enough money. We are not content. We worry about money. We fight about money. We lose sleep over money. Have you ever stopped to wonder why that is? Benjamin Franklin said, money has never made man happy, nor will it. There is nothing in its nature to produce happiness. The more of it one has, the more one wants. John Wooden was an American basketball coach and player. He was nicknamed the Wizard of Westwood. He won 10 National Collegiate Athletic Association National Champions in a 12-year period. He was head coach of the UCLA Bruins, including a record seven in a row. He once said, don't let making a living prevent you from making a life. Wise words from people who realized that money is not the blessing that we think it is. In fact, the prophet Malachi named it for what it is. Malachi says, will man rob God, yet you are robbing me. But you say, how have we robbed you? In your tithes and contributions. You are cursed with a curse. For you are robbing me, the whole nation of you. Malachi says, it's a curse. God curses the people because they are withholding from him. And when we withhold from God, we become unsettled. <clears throat> there is no peace. There is no joy. But David is their monetary re reward. I mean, I get it. Yes, okay, I'll get joy and I'll get peace. But is there a monetary reward? You know, other pastors, they promise earthly wealth. Now that's nice, <laughs> but it's not in the Bible. God never promises he's going to make you rich or give you wealth. But what he does promise is that if you give God your 10%, your 90% will treat you better than if you had kept it all. The Bible does promise that. The next part of Malachi says, bring the full tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house and thereby put me to the test, says the Lord of Lords. God says, go ahead and test me. That's rare. You have an invitation to test God. That never happens. God says, you take care of my kingdom and I will take care of yours. Your 90% will go further in this world than your 100% will. God guarantees that. If you're obedient and faithful, God will reward you. So secret number four tells you how to do it. Live by the 10, 10, 80 rule. 10, 10, 80. This is not from the Bible. <laughs> this is not from the Bible. The earlier you can adopt this rule though, the better your life will be. When your paycheck comes, you give 10% to God, you put 10% in your retirement and you live off of 80%. But see, here's the rub. The reason we don't tithe 
And the reason we don't put 10% aside for retirement is that we believe we need every last penny for ourselves. We've got to look out for number one. I can help you with that. Let me give you some questions, okay? When you're standing there at the checkout line and you're thinking about adding a few more things to the shopping cart, ask yourself this. Do you want it? Because if you don't, don't buy it. If you want it, do you need it? Because if you don't need it, you shouldn't buy it. Let's say you want it and you need it. Do you have the money in your savings to purchase it? Because if you don't have the money in the savings to purchase it, you shouldn't buy it. Let's say you want it, you need it, and you have the money set back to buy it. I should ask you this. Could you do without it? If you could do without it, then don't buy it. Let's say you want it, you need it, you have the money, it won't put you back, you can't do without it, then yes, go ahead and buy it. Otherwise, keep your money in the bank. If you asked yourself these five questions, every single time you made a purchase, I guarantee you, you would have more money in your bank account at the end of the month. The truth is, you don't need 100% of your income because most of the time you buy things that you don't need. But are you willing to live off of 80%? In an age of credit cards, the internet, Amazon Prime, can order something and it's delivered the next day. We live like royalty. We don't live within our means. In fact, living within your means has become difficult lately. Our society values excess. Our society values extravagance. Not moderation, not temperance. Living off of 80% requires discipline and perseverance. It means making a budget. It means saying no even when all your neighbors say yes. But are you willing to try? The beauty of the 10-10-80 rule is it's simple. It doesn't involve a financial guru. You don't have to take an expensive class. You don't have to read a book. 10-10-80 can be understood by anyone, whether it's a child, a teenager, or an adult. Secret number five. Determine your standard of living, and that will determine your standard of giving. In other words, if you're living beyond your means and making sure that you max out your credit cards every month, then of course you won't have money to give to God. Does that mean that I'm asking you to live like a monk? One pair of clothes, bread and water for food, sleep on a thin cot, no possessions? Of course not. Can you still take vacations? Sure. Can you still buy Christmas presents? Of course. But if you're going to live here on earth, I think you should have one eye on eternity. If you're going to invest in your heavenly retirement, it means you should have a discussion with your family about what it means to live within your means. Like asking those five questions that I offered earlier. I know we all want to live well. I know we all love toys. I know we all want to enjoy life. There's nothing wrong with any of that. But it's, it always seems like I don't have enough money. And if it always seems like I don't have enough money, then we're living beyond our means. One way to avoid that is your secret number six. Avoid going into debt at all costs. It's almost second nature to whip out the credit card now to buy things. But charging things should be the last resort. Proverbs 22, seven says, the rich rules over the poor and the borrower is slave to the lender. God doesn't want you to be a slave to anyone or anything. We are his. God wants us to be free. People who are rich, who actually have wealth, they avoid credit cards at all costs. Outside of maybe a home loan, rich people don't go into debt, not even for cars. Secret number seven is three words, percentage, priority, and progressive. If you can remember those three words, they all begin with P. What is percentage? Well, just remember that God asks you for a percentage. He doesn't ask you for a dollar amount. I think that's key. You know, when Jesus watches the woman 
at the temple give her two last pennies, he says she gave more than the rich man. Why does he say that she gave more? Well, he says that because it's about percentage. She gave more percentage, and that's what mattered. What is priority? It means that God gets the top cut, right? He gets first. The first portion doesn't go to the mortgage. The first portion goes to God. Malachi says, bring me the first fruits. Tithing is not, oh, what do I have here in my pocket? That's not tithing. God says, show me that this is important to you. Show me that my kingdom is first. And then lastly, progressive. We should be focusing on growing as generous people. We should be more generous towards God this next year than we were in previous years. Whatever we gave last year, we should try to outdo that this year. Look, when the offering plate goes by, how do you feel? That's really the question, isn't it? How do you feel? Do you feel joy? Do you feel peace? Or do you feel guilt? God doesn't want you to feel guilt. And he doesn't want you to live under a curse. Stop giving God your leftovers. You know, the Bible contains more than 700 direct references to money and hundreds more indirect references. In Matthew, Mark, and Luke, one out of every six verses deals with money. Of the 29 parables Jesus told, 16 involve a person with money. Jesus taught about money more than the kingdom of God. He taught about money more than love. Why? He told us. No one can serve two masters, he says, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Jesus understands. Remember, Jesus is Emmanuel, God with us. He came here to live in the trenches with us. And he gets it. Money is not just paper. Right? He understood that money has a grip on us. We have a love of money, and it actually hinders our worship. He tells us, he warns us, don't serve two masters. Why does he warn us? He warns us because we know we're going to try. We're going to try anyway. We try to serve two masters. Regardless of what Jesus teaches, we try anyway. But see, here's the thing. Money is a wall. Money is a huge giant. It's a barricade. It's something standing in your way. And it's standing in your way from serving more and from loving others more. Money is not your friend. Money is taking reward from you out of your eternal future. Money is robbing you of peace. Money is robbing you of joy. Money would be glad, you know, if you walked out here today, you walk out the door and you said, you know what, I'm going to give a little more to God. That would make money happy if you just tried a little harder. Jesus preached about money so hard because he wanted you to slay that giant, because he wanted you to have peace. He wanted you to have joy. So if you feel God is stirring in you right now, act on that. Change right now. Make a decision right now. Because if you don't, that feeling that you have is going to go away. And in a few more weeks, it'll be forgotten. And you won't change. Sow a seed of faith today before money tightens its grip on you. If you don't act on what God is stirring in your heart, money will win. And your heart will harden. And you'll be less on the path than you were before. I encourage you with all of my heart, find more peace. Find more joy. Keep your eye on eternity and be rich in generosity towards the one who has been rich towards you. Let's pray. 
Lord, perhaps on this New Year's Day, we might have wanted a, a teaching that was soft and gentle and beautiful in appearance, but to start off on the right foot, we need to make hard choices about how we spend our money and how we give our money. It's not just you. The Bible tells us to give our money to the poor, to help the downtrodden and the widow and the orphan. You tell us to look out for our fellow humans, our neighbors, and even our enemies. Lord, at Walden Church, we are a community church. And so we would love to increase our giving and our serving to this community. We love where you have planted us, and we love our neighbors, and we love you. May Walden Church give generously and serve generously in 2023. Help us to grow more and more like your son. Help us to have more joy and more peace. Amen. Thanks for coming out and worshiping with us today. Um, it's the new year, and so we're going to be starting off some new Bible studies. We're going to be doing a Bible study on Wednesday, starting on the 11th. We're going to be looking at the Chosen TV series. We'll be doing a series about that. So if you've watched that or been curious about it, uh, that'll be at 6 o'clock. And then our youth group is going to change its times as well. And so all the different age groups, whether it be junior high, high school, or college, will all start on the hour and go for an hour. And uh, we're going to have nice, tight, uh, age-appropriate lessons and uh, the kids, I'm sure, will have a lot of fun this year. We are also hiring. We are looking for a new children's director who can oversee all of our children's programming for the year. It's a part-time job, so if you know somebody or that's you, please submit your application to our church office. Thank you, and I will see you next week.